Hello, hello. Thank you for returning those who watched the first part. Hollywood owes black people reparations, racism, and early cinema, the dark side of Hollywood. If you haven't seen the first part, I suggest you see the first part and then come back to this part, to part two. And if you had seen part one and you're, you're coming to listen to part two, thank you and let's get on with it. The majority of cinematic representations of black Americans were of black men who were targets for the most overtly racist activities, including stereotyping, behavior, ridicule, violence, and violence and lynching. These painful images validated popular stereotypes of black America, such as the 1913 Associated Motion Picture Schools, how to write motion picture plays which featured a shiftless, worthless, fat Negro whose eventual good fortune brings him quantities of chicken, pork chops, melons, and other things dear to a darkie's heart. See, you have to have the most despicable, deplorable, revolting feelings in your heart for a group of people to constantly consistently produce so many demeaning demeaning hateful images to the world about black folks these people have such a revolting obsession when it came to how they see black folks but that they couldn't help to permeate not just this country, but the world with how they felt. I, my mind can't conceive what kind of hatred, dislike, jealousy, envy, whatever it was they had in their hearts. I can't conceive it because I don't have that kind of hatred in my heart. But just think about it, it, it. Like I said in many videos, white America, it was their job to bully black folks. It, it, a black person couldn't just walk around and smell the daisies and enjoy the beautiful sun God created on their skin. They couldn't do anything like that without being harassed in some kind of way. Whether it's a group of white men terrorizing black people in their communities, whether it's the police, it didn't matter. And I think if they, anytime they saw black people having a good time, amongst themselves it just burned their asses because they didn't want black people to have to enjoy anything in this country as far as they were concerned let's continue without positive images to counterbalance these negative ones early cinema did much to disseminate and perpetuate racial prejudice and various forms of violent discrimination even apparently innocent films such as Hard Wash, a biograph film company, 1896 produced this film. Another film called A Morning Bath, it was produced and created by Edison Film Company in 1896. Both were about black women washing black babies, contained racist overtones. For its contemporary audiences, the basic joke was that no matter how hard one scrubbed a black baby with white soap, the baby would still be black. It is in this sense that cameraman Billy Bitzer described the biograph film as a big laugh getter. You, you, see, you see things like that, they found funny. What's, what's funny about it? Now, what if black people turned around and just made a lot of movies and about created a lot of vulgar images, primarily about white folks, that, you know, no matter how off they wash their hair they could never get rid of lice you know what if we continuously did movies and tv shows like that like no matter what white people do we can wash their hairs with dog shampoo or horse shampoo and they'll still have lice what if we did that then the whole world in this day and age oh man you even have grandmamas coming back from the dead canceling that black 
negresses for its audacity to create such a vile image of us. We can still, we can wash our hair and get rid of lights. What are you talking about? Let's continue. There was another movie that was created by Biograph Film Company in 1902 called Laughing Ben. It featured a toothless older black American man laughing heartily. Lubins created a movie called A Good Joke in 1901. It was described in the company catalog as featuring three typical southern darkies, each of which is over 90 years of age. One is engaged in telling a funny story, and the facial expressions of the three men will be enjoyed by everybody who witnesses it. The sole joke was in watching aging darkies laughing. See what I'm saying? It's like they got off with just demeaning and bullying black folks. Anything that we did, what we felt brought us enjoyment, they flipped it around some kind of way to mock us and, you know, and didn't care. Let's continue. As previously mentioned, equally racist were the watermelon eating films. Now now we're going to get into how they use a beautiful fruit as watermelon that is helps with hydration and just overall healthy for you. How they turn that into a vicious weapon against black folks. And the thing is, these people eat it too. Now you get the understanding of what it means to cut off your nose to spite your face. That's exactly what white America has done to themselves. Every time they attack black folks on whatever level, they all they end up doing is cutting off their nose to spite their face. So let's continue. Biograph Films in 1896 created a movie or produced a movie called A Watermelon Feast. Then they had another movie in 1896 called watermelon eating contest this movie featured black men ferociously consuming watermelons in 1903 a film company named lubin produced a movie titled who said watermelon which featured women instead of men lubin's advertisement for the film proclaimed the usual watermelon picture shows darky men eating the luscious fruit. We have an excellent one of that kind of which we have sold quite a number. But the demand for a new watermelon picture has included us to pose two color women in which they are portrayed ravishly getting on the outside of a number of melons, much to the amusement of onlookers. Now, you got to ask yourself what kind of mentality you have to have to think that eating watermelon or making or having two people eat watermelons like wild animals is funny. You see what kind of mentality we've had to deal with? People who came from people who had hearts like that and they just perpetuated it on and on and on and in their minds they will never stop. And then you have people who had the audacity to come and say, well, we didn't do it. Our ancestors did and they don't, it's like some of the black folks, they have, they create a mental block when we say, yeah, we know you weren't around at that time, but you perpetuated it. You continued on with it. You continued on with the evil, dark stereotypes. You continued to do whatever you could to demean black Americans. It's like they they, they become, you know, mentally illiterate when it comes to us saying you still are part of the problem. Let's continue. In 1903, a movie was produced called Making an Impression. That was another film that glorifies the image of watermelon eating black men. The Coons' love for a watermelon once more forms the subject of a film, and as usual, the result is very amusing and popular. A magical effect is also introduced, which adds greatly to the interest and still more the mystification of the audience. A big Negro is even devouring a ripe watermelon with much appetite and gusto. 
you look for the complete disappearance of the fruit in short order but instead of diminishing in size it continues to grow larger until finally the magic prevails and the melon is whole once more ha 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 i bet you that audience was just tickle pink let's continue Stewart assessed these films tap into discourses on black animalistic behavior and revive Southern iconography returning blacks to the plantation. Didn't I say that? In their minds, they will never, ever let black people off plantations, but we're going to see about that. Let's continue. Other stereotypes were popular, including the image of the dancing darky. Black dancers performed in the Pick and Nanny Dance, an Edison film, 1894. Cakewalk, an Edison film, 1898. Another movie called A Coon Cakewalk. It was produced uh, by Biograph Film Company in 1897. Another movie called An Up to Date Cakewalk by Edison Film or Edison Film Company in 1900 and Dancing for a Chicken Lubin Company 1903 it was another movie called SNA's SNA's was a 1907 comedy and then it was another movie called The Dancing Nig it was about a black man who could not stop dancing whenever he hears music Black Americans often had to choose between two vices, gambling and chicken stealing. And Seg League's interrupted crap game, 1903, darkies abandoned a crap game to chase a chicken. The Tramp and the Crap Game, Edison Company, 1900, combined two stereotypes as a number of darky boys and street Arabs are engaged in a crap game just outside of the black entrance the black entrance to a theater the darkies suddenly give up the game of craps for the purpose of indulging in a southern breakdown edison company 1898 and lubin company 1908 made films titled buck dance with the Lubin catalog description, here is seen a number of smokes dancing for their favorite watermelon, and they pound the floor with their Cinderellas to beat the band. The luscious fruit is held by one of their number in plain view, and they finally stop dancing and engage in a tussle to see who can obtain the green fruit and devour it every imaginable pejorative stereotype was not only reinforced but also legitimized for white society by the images presented in early cinema blacks were portrayed as inherently lazy as in rastas and zulin 1910 which portrays its main character as preferring sleep to work rastas was a coon character described by bogo as the most blatantly degrading of all black stereotypes the pure coons emerged as no account roustabouts those unreliable crazy lazy subhuman creatures good for nothing more than eating watermelons stealing chickens shooting crap or butchering the english language rastas is looking for a soft spot when the scene opens and the picturesque banks of a small stream attract his fancy it is in the open sunlight but a darky likes warmth and he composes himself to take a nap again when black folks left the plantations you you have to say that these these mentalities of people who created such demonizing material it had to be motivated by fear you, you know, when you, some people, when they are afraid of something or fearful of something, they create the most idiotic, invalidated, 
narratives about people. They were so afraid that black people were going to retaliate in order to exercise or express that fear. They did it in such a demeaning way. They did it to, they expressed their fears by demeaning black folks. Let's take it, uh, let's continue. Rastas was a popular character appearing in several films, including Rastas and the Game Cook, Keystone Company, 1913, How Rastas Got His Pork Chops, Lubin, 1908, How Rastas Got His Chicken, also named Rastas and Chicken, 1911 film, Rastas Stole a Chicken in the Ranch Chicken. Who in the hell thought these movies were funny? Let's continue. That's that's the question you need to ask yourself. What kind of mind and heart did a person have to have to think these damn movies were funny? Anything made these people laugh. You see why they say in comedy it's easier to make white folks laugh? If you found these movies to be funny. Let's continue. Demonstrating the popularity of the character. In 1917, Rastas was still running wild and Rastas runs amok. There also were other comic versions of blacks in Africa, including the Zulu King, 1913, and Queen for a Day. In the movie Zululand, Zebo, a good-for-nothing negress, is easily frightened and eventually executed. Black Americans heritage was the subject of ridicule in other ways and burlesque lions and their tamer hagen beck circus a lubin film 1903 1903 black men are presented in a cage snarling and biting each other like wild animals while a lion tamer appears to tame them the film also plays on another stereotype the easily frightened Negro is represented in such films as Halloween and Coontown and 13 Club and Dixie Duo Down South. A producer, the producer was unknown, but it came out in 1910. Black men are easily frightened by two young girls, thus demonstrating that black men are both childlike and even less mature than a little girl. Yet another stereotype is portrayed in Georgia Camp Meeting. It was out produced in 1903 when a black person sneaks a drink of alcohol from a bottle demonstrating that even devout black Americans were alcoholics and thieves. Even black romance was belittled in such films as Whose Baby Is You? It was a 1902 film and Darkie's Kiss, a 1903 film as Butters Wright black american romantic love is almost non-existent sometimes romance turns violent however such as in keystones the elite ball where rastas and sambo tussle yeah you think about all the movies you've seen how many have been how many movies have been produced uh how many black romantic movies have been produced you know you go how many book movies have they done like the notebook you know, any sentimental, heart-touching, romantical movie, how many movies have been done where a black man and black woman together were the main characters? Mm-hmm. Let's continue. In The Black Prince, it was a crystal film, a 1912 film, a wife chases after her cheating husband with a carving knife. In A Night in Blackville and Prize Fight in Coontown, both the leg film company in 1903 the movie was about two blacks pull knives on each other and in the georgia wedding a vitagraph 1912 film the bride is so tall that she cannot make it through the cabin door where the wedding is to take place didn't i tell you guys that this animosity between black men and black women came from the hatred of white america i just listed I didn't just gave you a list of movies that were produced by them, by white producers who depicted black men and black women fighting each other. 
Now, they did all the the loving and romantical movies about white characters, but when it came to black people, black men and black women, they created this hostility between them. They couldn't even love each other on silver screen, so you know damn well they didn't want them to love one another in real life. Let's continue. Butters continues, making black American romance strictly humorous dehumanizes black men and women by arguing that they cannot have real human emotions or connections. Did you hear that? These fools said that black people couldn't have, black men and women could not have real human emotions and connections. That They didn't want you to come together. You, it was fine for black women to take care of these white babies. So if you really felt that black people were incapable of having real human emotions and connections, why'd you let them watch your babies? And then it, in some in some instances, the babies, the babe, white babies, ended up connecting to the black mama, the black mammy, instead of his own mama, his own birth mother. And then the white women would see that and become more envious of the black woman. Because you gave your white child to this black woman to take care of and feed from her breast, that white child developed a bond with that black woman that you could never create. And that made you more envious. So if black people were incapable of creating real human emotions, why the hell did you let them feed your children and take care of them? See the lies? See what I'm talking about? The psychological mind effing games. Ain't nobody has been mind effed as much as those called black Americans. Let's continue. Such images would not have been harmful and subtle was if black Americans romance was depicted in dramatic films. But those images were strictly forbidden. In those films, blacks were more concerned with the well-being of white families than they were with their own. That is when their families were portrayed at all. As noted, many films combine stereotypical images of black, black Americans. One example is If Dream, a 1913 film. As moving picture world described, if is a black man of the crap shooting variety he is industriously engaged in his favorite occupation of crap shooting and hoping for big winnings he fares badly in the game and goes home and his mind still dwelling on his imaginary winnings he goes to sleep in dreams he finds money on the street meets a swell girl visits the swellest cafe and throws money around promiscuously and is the ideal of his class but finally the crash comes he awakens and comes back to the actual things he realizes that all his fun was only in his imagination and is one disappointed coon he wanders out from his hovel, passes the old crap game, and hoping to realize something on his dream. He makes a grab at the stakes. He is successful only for a while. The bunch start after him, and after a lively chase, catch him and give him a dunking in a nearby water troll. This film portrays a black American man as a childlike and irresponsible, gambling away his little money, living in a hovel, and in the end, driven to thievery and a violent end. While the hovel could be used as an excuse to discuss the poverty of turn of the century black Americans, instead, the unmistakable message is that the black man's poverty is brought on by his own weaknesses. Furthermore, the little money that he has was probably secured, acquired through illegal means, not through gainful employment and hard work. These films absolve white America from any responsibility for the conditions of the black men. You see? See how I say? Now I'm going to say these movies were a political tool as well. They were a tool. They were a, a vicious tool used to justify what slavery did to black folks. It destroyed them. It destroyed their character. It destroyed their soul. And then when they got out of slavery, they were uh, they were unleashed in 
into a hateful world with nothing. And then when they tried to build, as Martin Luther King pointed out, you told them to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and they didn't have any boots to pull themselves up. When they went out there and made it some kind of way without the help of white America, without the help of financial institutions, without the help in any way, shape, or form, when they carved out something for themselves in this country, it would come. they would come and destroy it. And then they would go around and produce these movies showing that black people were lazy and all they wanted to do was eat chicken and steal and whatever else they contrived. It was all a lie. So let's continue. For many reasons, watching these images today or even reading the titles or catalog descriptions of these films is a painful experience. Given their popularity, however, and their devastating impact on black Americans, it is important for us to study these films. They tell us much about the root causes of racism in America. In this regard, it is imperative to note that the films did not represent the fringe attitudes of a few white supremacists. They were part and partial of main, mainstream American culture. Their prevalence on the screen combined with a lack of positive counter images reflects the attitudes of white spectators. As such, they provided a major obstacle to black Americans progress in society. But as disturbing as these images are, they were not nearly as dark as those that justified violence against black Americans as merely a good sort of clean fun. And then you see how they point out violence in the black communities, but they don't want to take a responsibility and accountability so, to how they projected violence against black folks by black folks and violence against black folks by white folks in their movies. Let's continue. No film is as offensive as a negress in the wood pile it was a 1904 film and it depicted violence against black americans the title derives from an old expression referring either to something to miss or to a dark-skinned baby born to a white woman the biograph catalog describes the film's racist plot this is a clever comedy production in several scenes. In the opening scene, the hired man is complaining to Farmer Jones that the wood pile is being depleted by thieves. Farmer Jones decides to adapt drastic measures and loads one of the sticks with dynamite. In the next scene, a colored deacon, one of the shining lights of the black church, is seen making away with the wood. The next scene shows the home of the deacon where he is taking his comfort at the kitchen fire while his wife is busy with the washing. The loaded stick is, of course, put into the fire and there is a terrific explosion and the building is ruined. Farmer Jones and his man appear at the critical moment and the colored thieves are given a punishment they will not soon forget. So not only did you set a trap, a booby trap, put load, you, you hid dynamite in the wood pile for which you believe somebody was coming and stealing your wood. The person who was caught who, who the person who was taking the wood takes it home to heat up their house unknowingly throw the dynamite in the fire with the wood blows up destroys their home and then you come and still beat them i don't know i've never seen a movie but they said gave them a punishment they would never forget so you know they never saw black people off the plantation so you know what they did to him on the plantations beat the sh living sh out of him so that is barbaric Bar barbaric behavior on so many levels let's continue someone by the name of stewart critiques the film Jacqueline says, Jacqueline Stewart says, this comedy demonstrates many elements that are typical of black representation in early cinema. The three black characters are played by white actors in blackface, wearing costumes signifying their traditional racial types. Mammy and apron and bandana, an uppity colored deacon striping a zip striking a zip coon figure in top hat and tails 
his partner in crime, a harmless, shabbily dressed, white hair Uncle Remus. The film depicts black Americans as habitual thieves and the film's punitive ending, a commonplace in early film comedies, functions to bring about narrative closure at the expense of black transgressors. Were this the only film portraying violence against black Americans, perhaps it could be dismissed as an offensive exception. But as Stewart notes, punitive endings indeed were common in early film comedies. Another example is from Edwin S. Porter's The Watermelon Patch, an Edison film in 1905. This time the darkies steal watermelons instead of wood. They take the watermelons home to their Ram shackle shack to be consumed ferociously again the shack could be used to emphasize their desperate poverty instead it reflects their childlike behavior as they celebrate while hiding their stolen goods from their white adult supervisors violence again is at the film's centerpiece in the final shot as the darkies run from the shack to escape from their white pursuers they receive a series of violent blows such punishment is perceived by its filmmakers as justified to punish these childlike beings for stealing. You know what, now that I think about it, when I was a child and I saw some of these films, I can't tell you how I saw them. I think they just played them like it was just normal. I, I used to see these images of men or people in blackface or actual black people playing these dumb child like characters you know eyes but open mouth wide well, I, I, I don't know my name type you know image they projected through film of black folks and I, I think as a child I used to wonder like why are black people always looking like this but then the black people that I dealt with in real life they didn't look like that but then on the image the, you know, my subconscious, these images, these vile, vulgar, demeaning images are going into my subconscious mind. Even though I know in real life, black people didn't act that way. But when I look at these images, it's been a seed has been planted. And then you wonder why there's self-hatred in the black community because of those vile images that were planted in your mind. You know, the, the saying, does light imitate art or does art imitate life? My question, easy answer is, art imitates life. In order to create the art, it comes from your experience. It comes from what you experience, and it comes from what comes from your mind. So it's always art imitating life. Let's continue. Yet another example of violence inflicted onto blacks includes Edison's Chicken Thieves. What is it with chicken and watermelon? Can white, can somebody answer me, white people? What is your obsession with chicken, watermelon, black folks, and telling lies? Let's continue. One contemporary catalog noted that the film was authentic because all coons like chicken. Biograph's version, also called The Chicken Thief, 1904 film was one of the largest grossing films of the year. Can you believe that? This is sick. This article really draws a clear picture of what who black people have been oppressed by. Let's continue. As well as one of the first multi-real films with real black actors. Other chicken stealing films include Chicken Spells Chicken. <laughs> Let me continue. It was a 1910 film. It was a 1910 film. And Mandy's Chicken Dinner. It was a 1914 film. These films were so popular with white audiences that by 1914, Lubin released The Tale of Chicken. In 1904, that's when they released that movie, which moving picture would describe as follows. Sam Johnson and Ruckus Hudson's 
are suitors for Mandy Jones. When Ruckus Bug gets a cold shoulder, his Negro blood is aroused. Violence was justified in film against such transgressions as chicken thievery. Another film called In a College Chicken. The film came out in 1910. College students beat an older black man who looks suspicious. And they had younger white college students beating the older black man. And then you wonder where the violence in the black community came from. In a twist on a formula in a movie called Chase by Bloodhounds, 1912 Camlin film, the black thief manages to escape because he is wearing clothes donated to him by the white farmer from whom he stole a chicken thus creating confusion among the bloodhounds. Violence directed at black Americans is further evidence in visual illustrations of lynching, rape, and the destruction of black body. Biograph's film called A Close Call, directed by Mac Sennett, makes fun of lynching. The film involves other acts of violence, including rape. Black American children were subjected to violence in such films as The Gator and the Pickin' Nanny. It was a 1900 biograph film. Here, a black child is swallowed by an alligator while the father eventually saves his child. The image is truly frightening. Butters writes, black children were often considered disposable. Edison's Ten Pickin' Nannies, a 1908 film, it's described by the trade journal Moving Picture World as Imagine 10 pickaninnies turned loose and on mischievous bent. Former catches and leaving but nine. Nine happy snowballs on a swing gate. One gets knocked out, then there are eight. Eight black cherubs swimming at 11. Mammy catches rastas, that leaves seven. Seven jolly coons on a tramp play tricks. Tramp wakes up and nabs one vamoose the six. Six bad chillin' foolin' around the hive. Bees get busy now there's only five. Five inky kids crawling through a hen coop door. Farmer scares one away that leaves four. Four smoky kids hunting up a tree. Gun explodes. We skidoo the three. Three black lambs, nothing else to do. Investigate a deep well, now there's two. Two cute ebonites with auntie having fun. Mandy gets a duckin' all gone but one. One chubby coonlet with a toy pop gun. Monkeyed round a gator, now there's none. These films include such violence as children who are knocked out, kidnapped, be stung to death, shot, drowned, and eaten by an alligator. The violence is sadistic, reflecting violent tendencies that a segment of the Euro-American population had toward the Black American population. In addition to the film's violence, the children are referred to as snowballs, chirps, coons, bad chillin', inky kids, smoky kids, black lambs, cute ebonies, and chubby ebonies. Since children are our most valuable and valuable natural resource, images that not only portray but also present violence as pure fun certainly represents the darkest side of the dark side of the farce. In addition, misnaming children is designed to not only marginalize but impose a destructive identity with names such as snowballs and cherubs. Sadly, there are few counter images. On only a few occasions 
was a black character portrayed as assertive and mixing in with white society. Nellie, the Beautiful Housemaid, 1908, a vitagraph film, also includes an assertive black character as does mixed babies with a confident black shopper grabbing items at a department store. In this regard, Porter's Laughing Gas, a 1907 film, is interesting it's a black it shows a black woman visiting a white dentist's office who has a tooth pulled she insists on a painkiller again an unusual act of black authority in a silent film a silent comedy she is seen not merely as a servant in a white owned house but also as interacting within white society most prominently she is seen riding on a streetcar and as she laughs the after effect of the laughing gas others black and white are caught up in her spirit these are remarkably positive images for this time in history yet they are offset by negative images when the dentist removes her tooth it is oversized suggesting that black americans have animal like teeth and the fact that her persistent laughter is produced by nitrous oxide administered by the dentist suggests that black female bodies are particularly susceptible to intoxication thus the image is not entirely positive for laughing black americans are still the main focus of the film's humor yeah um this article is a very very long one and i would i would end up if i if i read the whole article i would end up probably doing two or three parts and i really don't i don't want to sit here and do two or three more parts um as you can already hear from part one and part two this they did everything they could to decimate black people's characters um you know they like they say i said earlier the white um cinema had they gave no f's when it came to our dignity and how they perceive black folks they didn't care and um i don't want to do a third part or fourth part i i think this is enough for me but what i will do is is um attach the link to this the full article to the description you want to read how and see read it yourself and see how they decimated or tried to decimate everything about black america through film be my guest um i suggest that you do read it yourself uh, it's nothing much i can say it's nothing it's self-evident you know that this was uh intentional it was a psychological war against black americans the film was used to perpetuate whatever demonic stigma they wanted to create about black folks it's like they wanted to whatever they wanted to create negatively about black folks they did it through film they also did it through music Some something is going to come out that's going to totally decimate these lies that was created about racists to hide the truth of how they treated people uh who look like me in this country there's going to be a time where you're not going to keep hiding and lying about it with that said thank you again for your time um go check out other the other videos i've done and um share it share it with those who are interested in the true history um of black folks in this country around the world again thank you for your time and i'm out have a good day